Comes. I hope this. I hope this works. Uh, this is a. This is a bit of an, an experiment in terms of the. In terms of the meeting here, but I want to try and cover four things. Um, and this year we got some um, notes in advance from Marks, as I'm saying. It sometimes helps if you do have a PowerPoint. So I've now got a PowerPoint. Um, I do this at work all the time, but not um, at Marxism. And you'll see that the, the four things that I want to look at is that although, although the meeting's called Socialist Councillors Past, Present and Future, I also want to include within that some sort of look at the changing structure of the local council within which Socialist Councillors operate. Um, and I want to look at that because I want to suggest that if we look at it over the last hundred plus years, there has been a narrowing down in the range of what local councils and local government does, and that that has narrowed the scope for what socialist councillors can do, but partly that, that narrowing has been a response to the more radical interventions of socialist councils. It's a response of the state, etc., to do that. But that's also important because one of the key issues across the country at the present time is whether we should move towards a, an even more narrower set of terrain for local council, in other words, that's mayoral government or cabinet government. And um, certainly across the left, if you look at Respect, for example, Respect as an organisation are in favour of um, uh, mayoral systems and want mayoral votes and in Bradford. But I would actually argue that that is a mistake and that the principal socialist position is that we don't vote for mayoral positions, we don't vote for cabinet government. These are actually ways of actually excluding councillors from the day-to-day -day decision making within councils and they're actually a way of distancing uh, uh, councils uh, council themselves from any sort of uh, um, uh, control, however we consider that, by the councils themselves. So it's actually about watering down democracy and reducing accountability at the local council level. So that's part of a process that has been going on for 100 uh, plus years. So I want to do the two things. I want to think about the structure of local government. I want to think of, as we go through that, some examples of where social councillors have managed to engage more generally with the social movements in their communities. And therefore, I want to look at councillors and social movement activity. And what I particularly want to argue is that the high point of so socialist councillors involved in leading struggles actually are at the high points of the class struggle more generally in Britain. So actually, this, the, the shining light example still comes from the post First World War revolutionary wave. It's still the Poplars, the Little Moscows, and the various struggles in the 1930s because they were in, in, are, are shaped by the post war period and the post war struggles at that time. Because at that point, councillors were able to engage with the social movement activity that was happening outside in the social movements. And it was that interaction of the strikes, the, the activity in the streets, and what was happening in the councils which gave a vision of what social, socialist councillors should actually be involved and engaged with. For the majority of the time, most councillors are not engaged in that at all, and in, and in fact are actually shaped by the great division that continues to shape Labour-type politics or working-class politics in this country, and that is that there is something that happens in the trade unions, and the trade union movement, and then there is something that happens in the political movement, and that usually is the Labour Party, and that happens in Parliament, or that happens in MPs, or that happens in councils. And some of those councils may be trade unionists, Many of them will be trade unionists, but they don't necessarily connect what they do in the community, what they do in the trade union, with what they're doing as a councillor. They keep them quite, quite separate. So that's the sort of dominant history of the, of the last year, uh, hundred years. But with those examples, I think it's, it's, they give some examples of what I think we can be doing, what we aim to be, or where we would hope to be in a, in a new upturn of struggle, when we hopefully have lots of socialist councillors and some very practical things that if there are only one or two or three or four of us, what we can do. Okay, so, and I want you to do that in 30 minutes, so it might be a rush and it might be chaotic, so we'll try it. The first thing, just very briefly, that I want to start off with, and, and I mean, I'm sure most people in here won't need any convincing that this is the case, but I just want to re-emphasise very quickly that local government, um, you know, is often categorised as some sort of local administration, and that's all it is of, of, a, of a series of, of activities, you know, collecting bins or adult social care or education, but they're mere administrators. Of course, the local government is actually shaped by the local state. It's much more significant in terms of what it's actually involved with. And local councillors only make up a small part of the town hall, of local government, and more generally of the local state itself. So 
don't be under any illusions. Um, that's annoying me. I hope it's not annoying you as much as it annoying me, the, the, the constant drilling. But anyway, um, don't be under any illusions that councillors have it, a great deal of control over what happens locally. They don't have any great control because actually most of the day-to-day -day activity of the council is run by the well-paid chief officers and their staff, many of whom are paid extortionate sums of money. Actually, my best example is from 20 years ago. 20 years ago is a long time when I was leaving Glasgow, and even 20 years ago in Glasgow, in Strathclyde, which at the time was the biggest local authority in Western Europe, and in Strathclyde Regional Council, when I left 20 years ago, they were advertising a post to look at poverty in Glasgow and in Strathclyde, and they were being paid over £100,000. And the, 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 you know, there is a layer of incredibly high-paid officials. They are trained as accountants, they are trained in the business schools and they come along and they wipe the floor with most councillors in terms of day to day running. They are the people that make the decisions and run the decisions and put them forward for some sort of ratification at council meetings. And on top of that, of course, they are also connected with local business interests, local development agencies, the various different substructures of the national state. And so it's the local state that we're talking about here and their role in um, uh, and the role in the sort of reproduction of capitalism locally and the reproduction of labour power locally. They are involved in the provision of a whole series of states that are about the daily and intergeneral reproduction of, uh, of future generations of workers, of education, of adult social care, of council housing. I know there isn't much of it left, but nevertheless, that's, that's the role, that's the area in which it operates in. So, I want to start off just by emphasising the importance of it as an area of activity and the, the scale of what we're talking about and to get away from simply thinking about it as being an arena where there are 50 usually very old, I mean I'm now nearly 50 and I've been a councillor for nine years and I remain in the, the, the young section of Preston City Council, you know, I still remain one of the youngest who's there. So this is a very old, very male-dominated uh, council meetings and that would be typical of council meetings across the country. You know, we shouldn't think that that's where power rests or that's where, you know, significant uh, power for what's happening. It, it, it's, it is a, a chamber that exists in a, in a wider network. So, I want to do that now, to, to remember that, by looking very quickly at these four uh, periods. I want you to identify the four periods. And as we go through them, I want to think about what we consider to be local government at that time why it was considered to be local government in that way, and what was the role of socialists, what were socialists doing round about that. And the four periods I'm looking at is the pre-1880s, and I'm going to be very quick there because most of us didn't have the vote and there was no socialist council, so I'm just going to dismiss it. But, um, <laughs> but I do want to put it in place because actually it set in place some of the localisms about local uh, boards of guardians and all the rest of it, and the local bourgeoisie who were quite happy to be involved in those as their civic duties and saw it as pride. You know, when I go into Preston City Council, there is a long list of previous mayors. Now, they all look ridiculous because they've all got silly cloaks on and they've all got silly, you know, ties, fluffy tie things on, and they've all got that. But actually, the further back you go, the more grand they look, because actually they were very significant members of the bourgeois locally, in a way in which today's mayors, quite frankly, are not. Um, so, it goes back, it was seen as significant, and there's those four periods, and that's what I want to do, and to try and pull out of that those examples as we go through it. Okay, so the first one, very briefly, up to about 1880, the... Um, the this, this, the first period here is, is, is important, as I say, because it puts, in, uh, 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 it puts in place some of the organisational forms of local government that continue in the next period, where lo the local bourgeois, as local ratepayers, because in this period the dominant philosophy is laissez-faire or leave alone or a minimalist state, they don't want state intervention into the economy. You have to leave everything alone. If you are impoverished, it's because of your own failings. And when the state steps in, it steps in through the poor law and you end up in the workhouse. If you're too old, you end up in the workhouse. If you have a disability, you end up in the workhouse. Um, if you're unemployed, you end up in the workhouse. If you go on strike, there's a possibility that you'll end up in the workhouse. That's how the state intervenes for the rest of the time to keep the cost down. The local board of guardians, the local health um, uh, authorities that are set up after the health acts of the 1840s, these are controlled by local ratepayers who are the local wealthy and also the local voters. Because we're not involved as voters, we simply don't have the vote at this time. And so for socialists, 
the, the tasks of local government are really insignificant. If you look through the charters, of course the charters are arguing for increase of the vote and they're demanding things about paying conditions and working their own strike. But there isn't a focus on, you know, give us greater representation at local councils isn't necessarily part of those significant demands. As we go through the 19th century, there are campaigns for pensions, for education, for, um, uh, you know, for all those things. But again, it's not a focus on that we want to get into local councils because we don't have the vote to even think about structuring those things. There are demands for those social activities that in a, in a future 10, 20 years time will be part of local government authority, but they're not part of that. So socialists don't spend a great deal of time thinking about local government. And in fact, within the working class movement, especially in mining communities in Wales and in Yorkshire and parts of Scotland, there is huge suspicion about the local state and the state. And they have their own libraries. They have, through the union, they have their own doctors. They have, you know, theatre groups, all that tradition. Huge suspicion of the, of the local state and what the state does. And their organisation is through collective self-organisation and self-help as a strategy that, that they see as going forward. So... Up until 1880s, there's a developing local government structure. It's not one that many socialists would engage with. But that starts to change in the period between 1880 and 1940. And it starts to change because of the expansion of the vote. And the expansion of the vote to ratepayers and local working class people who are, start to be ratepayers in the 1880s and 1890s opens up the possibility of having working class representatives on a whole series of boards. Education boards. So you find that socialists stand to education boards for uh, uh, around local education authorities. You find that socialists stand for the poor law guardians. Um, if we think about something like George Lansbury, who I'll come back to several times as we go through this, but in the 1890s he stood for and was elected to the popular board of guardians. He was there and tried to implement various different strategies that undermined the philosophy of the poor law. The poor law philosophy of less eligibility, it was your fault, your responsibility if you were poor. The solution was the workhouse or perhaps outdoor relief, but it was about the degradation of those who were impoverished. For people like Lansbury who get elected, they try to shift that to, uh, you, to have solutions which are about munis good municipal works. He's involved in, um, uh, in the popular poor law board, are involved in buying up some agricultural land. That sounds as if that would be miles out of Poplar, but at the time it was not you know, so far away, and therefore they could involve people in what was called healthy work, not in the factories, outside. So if you faced poverty or unemployment and you needed a job, here was a good quality job, it would pay appropriately, that would be involved in that. It's not something that we would necessarily celebrate, but you see from that that those early socialists start to get involved with the notion that they can reform the existing system. Um, and they, they get themselves elected in that way. There are many good socialists who are elected to all these things, but the interesting thing really is that the way in which that is separated from other things that they might be doing as active trade unionists. In the 1880s and the 1890s, we have the wave of social protest, and if you look again at Lansbury's life, he's involved in raising funds for the strikers, he's involved in soup kitchens, he's involved in all sorts of things. But his political activity is something where they don't necessarily match up. He goes to the picket lines, he helps with the soup kitchens, he speaks at their meetings, and then he does something else. He goes to the Board of Guardians and he does for elections, and it's almost like never the two should meet, that there is the economic struggle and there is the political struggle that is taking place within councils. And that's the, essentially what happens. It reflects the sort of growth of syndicalism and the power, and that really is in place up until uh, the, first, the, the, the First World War, but it starts to change, and it starts to change either side of the First World War. And it changes either side of the First World War, in my opinion, not because somebody comes up with a bright idea, but because the world outside the council chamber changes. In other words, in the great movement, in the great unrest in the pre-war period, and in the revolutionary wave after the First World War, you start to find people who start to merge both the political and the economic demands, where you are in the council or you're on strike or you're on the streets, and you're, but these are all part of the same struggle. The, most clear, the clearest example of that, I still think, is George Lansbury and, the, and, the, and, and what happened in Poplar. And uh, in Poplar, I think this was incredibly important. It was, a, it was at a particular moment in the history of the Labour Party they get swept into power in 1919 in Poplar, as they did at a number of local authorities. The councillors are both Labour and sometimes are Communist Party members because you still have the ability at that point to be a member of both organisations. 
the councillors, as part of that general struggle, see their role as councillors as being to bring those struggles into the council chamber, to defend the working poor, to defend their communities. And therefore, in the most famous struggle, what they do is that they refuse to set a rate or re refuse to gather what are called precepts. They refuse to pay from the rates of the, pop the poor people of Popular to pay for the water board, the metropolitan police, the asylum boards, which, are th which they're meant to collect in Popular and then they're meant to hand over to those cross-London uh, uh, organisations. And their argument is that by doing that, by charging everybody the same rate, it means that the poorest people in Popular are paying the same amount for those services as the wealthy people in Westminster, and that's not just. And therefore, we're not going to give you the precept, we're going to keep that money, and we're going to use that to defend our local communities. The consequence is that they are imprisoned, and yet even in their imprisonment, they refuse to buckle and eventually they come out and win. Now, the interesting thing is that in that process, what happens? In the process, of what happens is that they are representing people on a daily basis, I think, first of all. As councillors, those that don't go to prison, those that are in prison, um, the, there are people like Julia Scar, uh, who's one of the councillors. Her house is an open house, as the description that people have today. She has constant, if you like, surgeries. She doesn't have a surgery just once a week. Her house is her surgery. And when working class women have problems, it doesn't matter what it is, they can go and knock on Julia's door and she represents them. Wherever possible, they collectivise the struggle. So you find that in the, the period when they run up to when they're going to be imprisoned, and in the early period when there's prison, there is uh, in people's uh, windows, there are, you know, defend the councillors, there's don't pay the tax, there's, you know, there's an attempt to, to, uh, to build a mass campaign. Not to see the councillors as leaders who will do something for you, but to see the councillors themselves as part and parcel of a movement which is tackling poverty, which is tackling inequality, and which itself is connected to those broader struggles in that period of time. And therefore, in that you get a glimpse of a different type of councillor. A councillor who represents communities, who collectivises, but who sees themselves some part and parcel of the mass movement of that time, not separate from it, not separate from it, and doing something in the council chamber. So you get a glimpse of a different type of councillor and council activity in what is, I think, the high point in the history of Labour councillors, because these were Labour councillors at the time, and I don't think that has been repeated since. There are other examples that we can briefly talk about where Labour councillors were involved in struggles, but this, I think, was clearly the high point. There were other examples that we could talk about. The other examples, I think, come from what were often called Little Moscows, and places like Fife and in the Welsh uh, mining uh, uh, valleys, and people in the, the, the Vale of Leaven in Scotland, where, counts, where, where communist councillors and communist trade unions were able to work together to defend their communities, to promote strike activity, and to address the various political issues that affected the communities uh, throughout the 20s and the 1930s. If we look at some of the little Moscows in Wales, for example, they were heavily involved in support, not just of local things, but uh, support for the uh, Spanish Civil War and the way that they raised international issues and saw so the, the, the national, the local and the international is part of a general picture. So in those two examples, I think we can start to see councillors who see themselves as representatives embedded within social movements and part of a bigger political project to challenge not, not just to provide, provide services for local communities, but to provide services, to defend services, but to do so as part of a broader social movement for social change. And we see that glimpse in a small number of, of, of examples uh, like, like, like that there. But the, um, as I said, this is very quick. <laughs> they, I, want to, I, want to, I want to contrast that with perhaps the main period of labour, in, labour involvement in local government, uh, and that is in the period from 45 to 75. What made those campaigns in some senses easier was not only embedded, being embedded within social movement activity, but, met, but that older structure, that older structure which meant that um, the the uh, unemployment assistant, assistance boards or the uh, local health authorities and the local they were they were local organisations that were to some degree were under local authority control, and they were therefore provided a focus for local campaigning initiatives. When the you know when they, when they were coming around with the means test or whatever it was, there were local organisations that you could target and you could focus your campaigning on. 
Partly in response to that, but partly also as a reflection of the development of the post-war state, we see a significant change to what happens to local government. The, areas, the broad areas of local government narrow, but as they narrow, they become much more heavily involved in some of the most important <coughs> welfare activities that affect our lives. So they narrow their range, but they are essentially involved in education, which we all go through, so we all have contact with the local state and through education. We council housing, because from 45 we see the rapid expansion of housing, and it's council housing. So it's your local council that is providing uh, the, the council housing and the rents and the rates. And so there's a narrowing, but there is a, a, a depth there. And in the post-war period, we see that being moved into child protection, child welfare, adult social care, and into those areas. So although local government's focus narrows, it becomes much more heavily involved in things that we actually rely on and which improve or shape or make our lives worse, depending on what, what they're doing uh, about those things. And that happens, of course, as part of the post-war welfare state expansion and as part of the post-war boom, and which provides the resources to pay for that. And one of the interesting things, I think, when I was doing some research for this, is that if you look at the government, the local government from 1945 through to 1975, and we look at the spending of local governments, actually, there is no real significant difference in the levels of spending whether you're a Labour Council or you're a Conservative Council. Actually, year on year, the, the amount that local governments spend tends to increase. It's on an increase right up until 1973 from 45. Year on year, local government spends more, and it spends it on those important areas of welfare provision. From 1973, for reasons that we'll come back to in two seconds, but to do with the end of the boom and the, and the crisis that happens in 73, that comes down. But in that entire period, the amount of money spent, it's not that Labour are generous and the Tories are parsimonious. They are very, very similar. If there is a difference between the two of them, it is that the Tories tend to spend a bit more on education and Labour tend to spend a bit more on adult and child social care. That's, so there's a, you know, the budget in between them, but the general picture is one of the same. And in this period of expansion, this is where the real notion that the local government is there as administrators. The real decisions are, made, are taking place within council com uh, committees. The council committees are very powerful organs within the local state and that's where the arguments take place. I know that when I was in the Labour Party, this was a, some considerable time ago now, uh, in the 1970s actually, but anyway, uh, but when I was in the Labour Party, the, uh, the finance committee was a, was a large committee, 10, 14 people would be on it. And in a sense, that did seem to make some sort of uh, uh, logic if you were in Labour, because if you were a, a Labour member on the finance committee, you maybe were a shop steward in the local car factory or you were in the local docks or whatever. And what did you know about finance? It was more difficult to get your head around. But the 14 together could work out and could tackle the expertise of the finance officer who was always trying to get one over you. So the council committee meant that collectively within the Labour Party structures it was possible to offer you know, some kind of opposition or to, you know, to, to some sort of control over those financial officers. And that tends to be how the system worked right the way through that period. It, it, it's a period of growth, it's a period of expansion, it's a period of expansion that reflects the growth of the post-war uh, welfare state. But that comes to a shuddering halt in 1973. And in 1973, the, uh, the post-war boom uh, finishes, and actually at the same time you start to see government, national governments restricting the amount of money that local governments have got to spend. And actually, from 45 to 73, year on year there is an increase in the amount of money that goes from the central state to the local government, and there is an increase in local government spending. From 1973 it's almost completely reversed, it's like a peak, and it goes down from 73, and it's more or less matches in mirror form, if you like, what was happening in another period, but it's now on its way down. There is less government grants as they try to pull back in austerity. There is an attempt by uh, local authorities to raise that by increasing the rates and then we move on to the poll tax and various different things to try and control it. There is a clear attempt to control local government spending and that means control of local government spending of course means controlling it in the main areas in which they're involved, which of course is housing, social care, and education, which has a detrimental impact on you and my life, because these are the things that we have uh, huge uh, conflict uh, about as well. 
The interesting thing is that as this change came about, there was one of the most notable, I think, struggles of the post-war period for the Labour Council, and that was in a place called Clay Cross. And Clay Cross' struggle in 1972 was, it was against the, the Finance Act, the Housing Finance Act of 1972. And the House Finance Act was an attempt by local government to force rents up and local, uh, uh, to force local authorities to put the rents up. And Clay Cross refused. It was a pound a week, and Clay Cross uh, councillors refused. And um, they, were, they, 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 were, they were the first ones, and then other places like Cowdenbeath and, um, well, were, were going to follow them on. But gradually they abandoned, and Clay Cross councillors were left themselves. And they were turned on viciously by the Labour Party for daring to challenge the law. They were turned on by the Labour Party. They were abandoned. They were banned from office. They were all declared personally bankrupt. They put, it was a huge sacrifice that they, that, they put, that they put themselves through. But one of the things that I think is quite interesting is if you ask where was Clay Cross? Clay Cross was in the Derbyshire Coalfields. 1972 was the great miners' strike in 1972. And again, you know, the confidence of the miners' strike, what was happening outside the council chamber was giving the confidence to those councillors inside the, the council chamber to actually say that they weren't going to implement things that were going to affect those people that they represented. So it was a fantastic struggle, but again, it can't be just seen as a council struggle. It's absolutely tied in to their location and to the year and to what was happening at that point and in that time. So again, another example is that comes to it uh, there. 73, 75 though is important because as Tony Crossland said in his, in his uh, biography, he said that his phrase was that the party's over. Labour and Tory from that time have, have, over, uh, have both st uh, stood over an eroding of local government uh, uh, financing and with it an eroding of local government democracy because the two things go hand in hand. Because as they have eroded local government financing Councillors and communities who have complained about austerity and cuts throughout that period in time have been a problematic source, a problematic thorn on the side of government. And as the move towards restriction of local government finance happens in the 1970s, there is a new discourse develops and it's called the discourse of modernisation. And the discourse of modernisation started with the Tories, continued through Labour, continued through the Tories, continued through Labour and has continued through Lib Dem. It, the, the discussion of modernisation is effectively about how do we marginalise the problematic voice of those councillors who won't accept that councils are there to simply manage national government diktat. And the way that they do that has been to erode local democracy. The way that they do that has been to change the power within the council chamber. So that picture that I was drawing earlier on of the large finance committee, which was how the post-war local government welfare state functioned and how Labour members who were you know, shop stewards at various places could try to control the finance officer, those committees have been abolished. They simply don't exist in that way anymore. Now when you are a councillor, what happens is that you are on committees, but the committees are simply advisory, and they are advisory about the most bizarre things you would possibly think about. Let me give you one example because I don't have any choice about where I go because I am one of 57 and Labour councils who, Labour councils who dominate press and city council like to humiliate if at all possible I suppose. So they put me on to the, the weakest committees and one of the committees that I'm on is on, is, on, is on the Community Regeneration Committee. Now if you thought about what Community Regeneration Committee, it doesn't sound as if it's a too bad a one for us to be on. You're on there, I'll fight for communities, I'll go on regeneration and then you get the plan of work. So three years ago, the first six months of my committee meetings on the regeneration panel was to look at the provision of public toilets in Preston. Now, I went to the first meeting and I thought we should have more of them. They should be clean and they should be free. <laughs> but, <laughs> but to string that out to six months, I was really, I mean, I, I can talk, but, you know. Um, even I struggled for the second meeting, never mind the sixth. So a narrowing down of what the councillors actually are, are, are there to do. And under both Conservative and Labour government, the modernisation has taken the form of increasing the salaries of full-time officers. So now in press and set the council, the full-time officers, uh, uh, the, the senior full-time officers, the lowest paid is on 80,000. Okay? But modernisation has also meant the attempt to professionalise a layer of councillors. So you may think that all councillors are equal. 
but some councillors are more equal than others. <laughs> if you are a councillor in the, le the, the lead organisation locally and you manage to go onto the cabinet, then you will be well paid. You didn't used to get paid, you used to just get expenses, but now we all get paid. So, as a lonely councillor, I get £200 a month and I don't get any expenses, so that partly covers expenses or for local SWP full timers. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and that's where that money goes. But if you are the leader of Lancashire County Council, you get £45,000. And you're a retired teacher on a full pension. Yeah. If you're on the cabinet, the lowest you will get paid in Lancashire County Council is 40000 So there is an attempt to professionalise the councillors and an attempt to professionalise the organisation and both of those operate in a way which marginalise the voice of ordinary councillors or backbench councillors. That is made worse because although there's always been a whip system working at local councils, that now is much, much firm. I mean, even over the toilets, there was a whip. Right? And you think how bizarre that is. But on almost every single issue that you go to a meeting at Preston City Council, it is whipped. And so, yesterday there was a full council meeting. I could have told you before I went to that council meeting how each vote would go. You can predict it. Okay? So all we get to do is to accumulate. Okay. So, that process, and, and of course the next stage of that, that's exactly what mayor councillors are about. And their argument about this is that the go local government has now changed sub so substantially that we have managed, in their terms, we have managed to get rid of the post-war welfare state. We have put everything out to tender and out to privatisation. What we really want now is what they call an enabling council. We want the council to enable the services to be delivered by a variety of organisations. But if the services are being delivered by a variety of organisations and not by the council themselves, then the role of the council should be minimalist. And the role of the councillor should be completely marginalised. And the ideal that some of them would like to go to would be the local council type meetings that they have in some American states where the councillors meet once a year to ratify the contracts that the council is going to put through. And part of that is what cabinet government and mayoral government is all about. When they argue for local mayors, it's to further modernise, further professionalise, i.e. to open it up to all these processes of marketisation, of, te of tendering, and to marginalise councillors within that process. So the last point there, because Maxine's telling me to shut up. The last point there is, so what does this mean for us as socialist councillors? What do we draw from the lessons of this and where do we go on? First of all, I think we have to look back at the best examples, and I've been very quick, and if we want, we can discuss more of those uh, in, in, in the open period and the summing up. But it does seem to me that rather than reproducing the separation between what happens in the streets and what happens in the trade unions and what happens in the administration of the councils, that in the best examples that we can think of from British history were when we pulled those things together. So we start off with a vision that what we want to do is to bring councillors and trade unionists and community organisations together. And that's why yesterday the motion wasn't the best motion in the world, but I was proud to take an NUJ written motion to Preston City Council because it's part of a process of building those links where trade unions and trade union branches and anti-cuts groups can come to me and say, we want this motion put through, that's what you should do, and I should do that because I'm there as a representative of my constituents, but also as a representative of the local movement. So that's one thing that we have to do to deepen that process of the connection between councillors and social movements. The second thing is that we have to be good community shop stewards. What I mean by that is that if you think about your shop steward in your workplace, it's not the case that every single day he or she is calling you out on strike or that he or she is fighting for a better wage rise, although hopefully there's a lot more of that coming. But the key thing is that they will fight about everything. Telephone wires are in the wrong place and you have to step over them. There's a health and safety issue over here. Your tea breaks aren't long enough. The toilet facilities aren't good enough. It doesn't matter what it is. But by doing those things, you earn the respect of those who work with you, who then will engage with you around the bigger issues so that when you take the stop the war motion or you take the anti-racist motion in, they will listen to you because you're a good person who fights for them on a day-to-day -day basis. In the same way, we as councillors have to do the same within our communities. We're community shop stewards. We pick up every issue. If somebody has got rats, if somebody's got 
dog shit out the door, that's the example from yesterday. If somebody's got damp houses, it doesn't matter what it is, but it has an impact on their lives, it makes their lives more miserable, and therefore we have to take it up, we have to try and fight, we have to try and solve it. If we can collectivise it in that community, then we do so, but if not, we take it up on behalf of that individual. And the more that we can win those individual cases, the more they trust us when we go to talk to them about Palestine, about privatisation of schools, about the EDL we are coming to press, and or whatever the issue is. So we take, in a very serious way, the small issues, because we have a vision that by winning the small issues, we can pull them over on the big issues. And again, that seems to be what Julia Scar and some of those councillors in Poplar were doing way back in 1919 and 1920, and we should reclaim that tradition as part and parcel of us. And the final thing that we should do is that the reason that we are in the council chamber is not because we think that we can have a better view of working those committees. Even if there was... Even the Preston City Council Community Regeneration Committee was made up of me and Max and Charlie Kimber and various other people in this room, we would, okay, we would have three toilets. But beyond that, <laughs> beyond that, you know, beyond that, it wouldn't really change the world. But what we have to do is make sure that we use the council chamber as a stand, as a megaphone that we are the ones who are using every issue that comes through council, that we are the ones who are taking up every issue locally and taking it through the council as a way of deepening the struggle outside the chamber, of a way of building the links between the unions. When they try to divide us, that they were there to offer an alternative vision of bringing us together, of generalising the struggles, of generalising the struggles against cuts and austerity and racism, and as part of that process, to be part of rebuilding the electoral left in this country as part of a process of challenging the roots and equities of capitalism. Hi, can you hear me okay? Um, my name is Claire Lyle, I'm a um, community worker in Glasgow, my shop's steward with Unison as well. Um, it's just been, I missed the beginning unfortunately, uh, sorry about that, but I, I came in at a point that I thought was quite interesting, talking about well, recently we've been in meetings with Labour councillors. Labour were under a wee bit of pressure recently with the elections. You probably saw a bit of that. They did get back in again in Glasgow. However, they did get a wee bit of a hard time. Um, but we were in as uh, shop stewards uh, and you see the Labour councillor who does to come in and see us, the head of social work. And uh, we were saying to him, where's your line in the sand here in terms of the cuts? Because the cuts that they've put forward in Glasgow are predominantly affecting people with disabilities. That's the way they've chosen to do that. So rather than cutting our terms and conditions at this stage or cutting facilities like community centres and libraries, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're putting these individual budgets in place, which really are a mask. They're saying it's choice for people, but it's a mask for cuts. People are facing 50% cuts in their budget in terms of their care packages. So it's, it's having a horrendous effect. That coupled with the welfare reform situation folk are going through. So we spoke to the Labour councillor system Basically what you're doing is you're administering these cuts then and where's your accountability because people are actually getting organised and getting out in the streets and what happened in Glasgow was the union got together with uh, community groups and uh, are fighting this collectively along with people in the private and the voluntary sector, workers who are affected as well and I think that, that that's a good way forward and it's obviously, you know, it's important that we're outside lobbying and council meetings and all the rest of it, but what I think was key as well was that a couple of the councillors, it was a Green Party councillor actually, two of them, went in and put forward a motion that we in Unison had put together in order to try and fight this cut. And that, the people, the community activists that were there saw those councillors going in representing people. So councillors on the left are shown to be accountable when they're doing that and they're having a voice. But also it's important as well that we as workers are prepared to take straight action to fight these cuts. There's absolutely no way about it. We've asked them to set a needs budget in Glasgow. They're not prepared to do it. We've not got any choice now. We need to look at that soon. And I'm quite sure we'll have the community at the back of us. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Ray Holmes. Um, I was the respect councillor for Bulls of District Council. <coughs> And at, the moment, at that moment in time, when I was elected, I walked into the council chambers and I knew I was the enemy within. Without any question of doubt, I, it was, the idea was placed in my mind that I will achieve nothing, I'll get nothing, and they're going to stick to it. And these were Labour councils. Five were independent, 
and we were all classed as the opposition. The problem with it is that it's not just personalities. This is ideology. You're looking at people who served with me on the council, or I served with them, I'm not really bothered which way you look at it, but they've been councillors for 25, 35, 40 years. Never faced an election till I walked on. Never met anybody on the street. Never discussed social issues on the street or in council. And when opposition came, they rallied around each other like wasps on a magnet. Honestly, they were zap. And all the council jobs that had anything to do with improving the condition of Sharbrook people were taken to joint labour and the good independence with them. And they selected everything. This, this was charismatic leadership par excellence, okay? And we had to deal with, um, I had to deal with driving licences, you know making sure a criminal doesn't break one of our kids in the back of the taxi. It was chronic. And when you face this with it, when you face the people with it, <coughs> what are you going to do about non-representation at both of these accounts? Oh, well, we're used to it. It's been like it for 40 years. That was it. This is the opposition. And it got even worse. And as, as Michael has already stated, the, the rate of shift of power from local level to mid-management level, which is Derby County Council, or even regional council, the, the government brought out a couple of years ago complete management of development programs. And it, was, it followed over three separate areas. Industrial development, we were paying millions of pounds out for companies to come from Manchester, settle in, 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 in Sharbrook. We were also paying millions, trillions of pounds of shifting roadworks from where they were needed in the little villages to main thoroughfares to join up with the, with the, with the uh, <coughs> motorways. And finally, we were centralising, the government was centralising funding for different projects going on in the villages and towns. And one of them was the education programme. And when it came to voting on that, we decided to set up, me and my colleague of mine, set up an anti-academy program. And oh my God, we got the wrath of God. We got, we, the both of us were, were summoned to different council meetings where we were told to behave. And you know, I won't, I won't behave, but there you are, you, we were told. And even the council voted against us, even though we, we were both ex-teachers, um, and I, was a, I used to be a, 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 an advisor to the FEU, National Council in London. So we knew about, we knew about schooling, we knew about governance and so on. And when we got up and proposed an, uh, an opposition to accepting this £40 million pound grant note, PPI, PPFI, the leader of the council said that I was ignorant and because I'm a city dweller, have you ever been to Shardbrook? Have you ever heard of it? Yes. No, right. <laughs> You'll know full well it's not a city. It's not a city thing. It's, this is a mining village decapitated by Thatcher and demoralised by everybody since. We, we, we're told we can't argue that point of view because we are city dwellers. I'm a city to I talk the city language. We're talking about not privatising education, talking about arguing against the privatisation of the school and the education system. And these Labour leaders voted for it and ordered me out of the council. So we, we lost it all. And if that's the way that local government's going to be, uh, anybody who takes up the challenge and the cudgel, good luck. Yeah. Uh, my name's Graham Campbell, I'm from Glasgow North Branch and I stood in the election just gone in Scotland uh, for the Glasgow City Centre Award. 
hopefully one day it'll be the next map of nightmare. But then, um, I want to pay tribute though to the fact that you've actually raised some of the points about the strategy and tactics of what socialists should be towards the local state. I think you really raised a really important theoretical question about the, the, the strategy of neoliberalism in the last 30 years using the local state as the key weapon of class struggle against not just council unions, but actually against communities full stop. And I wanted to actually put the, the, the flag up for community organizations. Often, if I do a straw poll, if I ask everybody to put their hand up and say, how many of you are trade union activists? Probably most of you would put your hand up. In fact, why don't you try it? Um, how many of you are trade union activists? Okay, put your hands down, the majority of you. Now, if I then said, how many of you are members of tenants associations or a local charity or a local community organization, maybe you run a sports group, put your hands up if you're one of those. Well, less than us, but about a third of us. Now, if you look at the working class today, in most communities, you'll find that the most organized people, the most politicized people, who are the ones who do the lobbies against the council chambers, against the cut, to try to lobby their local labor councillors or whoever else to not cut something, it's going to be community activists. And it's a, it's a, it's a site of struggle, which, and it's a, site, a form of organization our community has evolved in, in reaction to the local neoliberal state's attack upon our services. And I, I want to appeal to comrades to take this area of work a lot more seriously than we have done, because I think it's the key to help, helping to mobilize a whole load of people in our communities who would be on our side, who agree with our arguments of, about uh, you know, defending public services, defending local communities' existence as a community. We, we should be the ones being involved in that struggle. I, I really would hope that we get a proper uh, you know, understanding and therefore how to intervene. Because if you're looking at what's the strategy to stop the cuts, you know, how do we defend those jobs? You know, you know, we clearly can't do it by defending the council because the council's part of the problem. The council is the instrument being used to attack us. We want to promote the self-organization of the working class, socialism from below. Therefore, the councillors, obviously, they're going to be the tribune and oppressed, but they need to be the place where people look to, to actually walk into different forms of organization. We need to be talking about participatory budgets. We need to be talking about needs budgets budgets and have, offer a strategy to those who are elected that, okay, your community will back you up if you take this stand against neoliberalism, against the cuts, in defence of the workforce and in defence of your community. Well, after I retired, I went to live with my wife, whose first husband was a small farmer who was made bankrupt. I live in Sidmouth, the heart of the revolution, yes. <laughs> Very uh, pleasant place. While I've lived there, I have been asked by several people to stand for the council. First of all, there were the frustrated councillors who could get nowhere, and because I was known as a local activist and was able to argue things, the chair of the Tory party rang me up and asked me if I would stand as an independent. Because <laughs> they just, they said, they know, we know you're a, a, a Marxist and a socialist, but we need somebody good on the council. <laughs> then, there's, there's 40 Tories, five Lib Dems, and, and six independents. Two of the independents are doing a brilliant job, and they've got, they are using the megaphone. They've got blogs. They are communicating really well. They're organizing, and they asked me to stand. I came here today to find out, is, there, is it worth my while now I'm retired doing this? And I'm not sure I'm convinced yet, but some of the things that have happened have included people who are crushed and beaten, have been telling me the history of the, the socialist activities in Sidmouth over the years. Um, and, you know, they want to rebuild that. They have no real hope. They're, the Trades Council has gone long ago. The Labour and uh, Union Club is closed. The Unitarian Church is empty. I'm now chair of the trustees there, and we're trying to turn it into a community centre. But is it worth my while being with those people? What we've done is we've got... NIMBYs who were thinking of blaming immigrants for the speculative builders putting up houses all over the area of outstanding natural beauty. I said, I'll join your committee, and we've turned it round, and we've had protest marches to the council chamber, we've had 4,000 signatures, we've had meetings in the market square, we've had public meetings where people have said to me, if we win this, Robert, I'm leaving the Conservative Party, I'm coming over to your lot. <laughs> now, I know that's just a ludicrous fantasy. <laughs> There's only two members of the party in my town, and one of them is not a member of my family. So, <laughs> so I, know, I know, you know, in one sense, I just have to come here to recharge my batteries. But meanwhile, we've got the chair of the committee pushing this through, 
charged with bullying and found guilty on six counts. We've had members of the bourgeoisie living in posh houses researching the East Devon Business Forum and being aghast and publishing the information about how the whole council is in the pocket of this organisation and that we are paying our rates to support them to push forward the interests of big business. Meanwhile, my son says he thinks we are seeing the biggest thing since the repeal of the Corn Laws. <laughs> he's, a, he's a lawyer. <laughs> he says, the big ruling class's interests are at opposition to the small entrepreneurs. And that's where they got a weakness, that you could stick a Marxist lever in and break East Devon open. Uh, good afternoon. I'm from uh, Leeds, which um, you probably heard is uh, going to be made into a super city. Uh, it was the first uh, uh, city to actually join the queue for Eric, Eric Pickles' upgrade of these strategic cities. Leeds is an urbanisation which is actually the, the densest in the UK outside London um, and as a Labour Council. The strategic plan that the Labour Council put forward is actually a formula of uh, neoliberal speak. They've eliminated any reference to unemployment because that smacks of disadvantage. Now it's called worklessness. They've re eliminated any reference to disability. That's worklessness. They've actually taken as part of their commitment to make Leeds a super city that they're going to eliminate the NEETs. NEETs are the not employed uh, in education or training. How they're going to eliminate them, I don't know. It sounds like genocide, but that's their, what's the, that's their promise. So what is also a very insidious feature of this council is also its, its, its addiction to uh, PFI. There is presently a scandal going on in Leeds, which is for an incinerator which is being bid by Veolia. Veolia, the company which has provoked and locked out the stri strikers in Sheffield, it's up to its neck in Palestine in the occupied in the, in the, in the uh, settlements. At, at council meeting after council meeting when these things have been raised, it's been said by the executive board and by the chief, chief officers that any, any uh, matter of ethical consideration is not a matter for the, for the council, it's, it's beyond their remit. What has happened in the course of this, this scandal unravelling is that some councillors have chosen to work with the SWP, oddly enough, myself in particular, on this question of Veolia and the incinerator. And what we've actually found is that PFI is what we all know, it's a death trap. It's a death trap of debt and risk at the expense of, 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 the, of the public. The, the, the incinerator site is, in, is in a location which has the worst asthmatic and respiratory disorders of any area in Leeds. It is in one of the worst uh, special out, super output areas in, in, the, in the European Union, in the bottom 5% of any elected area. In, in, that, in, uh, in, in, in the European Union. And that, because people there are poor, they're unhealthy, they're regarded as having no voice. And because it's a dump, it's going to be an even bigger dump. And they, 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 those conditions will, not only will they, those who have houses will be living in negative equity, will they be stuck there. Now, what, what is also a feature of Leeds is it's a massive housing problem, crisis. Leeds Council has year on year supported property speculators coming in, building apartment blocks which remain empty on which there's no council tax whatsoever and there's no squatters movement. There has to be a squatters movement in, in, in situations like this where people move in and demand social housing in decent conditions. And the final thing is the, in, is, is the question of this, as what Michael said, the emasculation of local authority, of taking away any, any kind of accountability of, from, from councillors. Because you have executive boards which are a semblance of democracy and they have councillors upon them. But they actually operate under the direction of full-time appointed uh, executive officers who are paid superannuated salaries and can actually have executive powers which overrule the executive boards if necessary. And consequently, Lee's now has got a bill of £1 billion in PFI accounts which, which will take something like the next generation to pay off. We can only stop that incinerator, we can only stop the earlier by getting direct action. There is no other route we can yeah. do it. We have to get people to chain themselves to the gates, we have to have civil disobedience, we have to really test the ability of those councillors to stand up and represent the people who are elected, that elected them in the first place. We have to fight.
I just wanted to, you to go into a bit more detail because you were so rushed in your speech about the enabling state because uh, I'm, I'm a researcher of government policy and I'm just so shocked when I find out how much, go, how much of local council services are farmed out not just to the private sector but I also think it's a crime that they're farmed out to charities as well because they are still undemocratic, unaccountable forces however good their intentions are and I, I just think uh, if you could go in more detail as a counsellor, because I only know from documents and interviews and stuff, not as counselling, and, and how that can be part of the struggle as well. A tar charities are not democratic, I think that has to say, however good the individual charities are. And also, um, in your group, you skipped over probably, because uh, you remember the SWP, you skipped over the the struggles of the 80s and the rate capping in, or at least yeah, not in the talk, it may have been on PowerPoint. Uh, and I was just wondering what lessons can be learned from those recent struggles in that, you know, even though it was before I was born, it's not that long ago, um, and, and how those struggles can be learned and what went wrong with them and why they failed and what can be taken as good. And finally, my final question. Um, you've gone on a lot about, people have said here about individual councils resisting an individual community service, but are there any examples of whole councils resisting, like they did in the 80s, like they did post-war, of stopping rate capping or just not cutting budgets? Because it seems it, one or two can make a difference, social movements can make a difference. I'm just wondering if any councils have been captured and if any Labour Party councillors actually have backbone. <laughs> Hi, I'm a comrade from East London. I just wanted to make a quick contribution about um, some of the decisions that the council have made in Newham, where I used to live. And one of them that really outraged me and made me quite angry was um, Sir Robin Wells, the mayor of Newham's decision to take out um, in books in other languages than English and newspapers in other langu languages from the libraries. So now in Newham libraries there is no books in any other language than English and this was to encourage immigrants to learn English. <laughs> and this was his decision and I, it just happened. There was no resistance from it and the council is, I think it's pretty much all Labour except for maybe two or three respect candidates, I'm not exactly sure. And it was just allowed to happen and there that, like there's about four libraries, maybe five in Newham, and none of them have anything other than something written in English. And that, that is, I know you, Michael was talking about the shift in power in councils and that how there isn't so that is, as the uh, comrade before was saying, that is um, different roles are given to different people now. But it, I, I didn't, I'm like there was no fight back, and that that although like myself I was angry I didn't find out about it until six months after it already happened and there was not, not much me on my own could do than other, other than write a really angry letter to him which I'm sure he read <laughs> but, <laughs> there's just yeah my, my wouldn't say plea but just to encourage you like when you see something happening and you hear about it straight away like take it to your to your council take it to people start groups meetings to your branch meetings if you're in one to, to fight back against these old decisions because, yeah, Sir Robin was maybe Labour, but I can honestly tell you he is more conservative than anybody else that I know. I'm a comrade from Bristol. Um, uh, the guy just before the last speaker mentioned about the struggle in the 80s, and my housemate, his mum was actually one of the Labour councillors um, who resisted the cuts um, in, in the Liverpool Council. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think afterwards uh, they, she was kicked out of the party, wasn't she? Yeah, but basically it, she, she was able to be part of the council that resisted um, Thatcher's cuts being shafted onto the local councils um, and held off on that. So obviously councils can be used um, to go do good, um, but at the same time, I think there's you've got to be very cautious about uh, electoral politics. Um, I think that what you tend to find is uh, when a political movement or an organisation gets subsumed into the idea of using elections as a way to get things achieved, uh, where they use the position to get them achieved as opposed to actually um, just using the uh, the election as a way to build people together and build up the class at the same time. Because really, as revolutionary socialists, 
we're not talking about getting into positions of power so we can do things bit by bit. We're talking about building up the class so they can actually be the people that make the change for themselves at the same time. So what we have to do when we're talking about councillors and council elections is be looking at how we're using it to do that, how we're using it to build within the class and build the class at the same time and be a part of that class as opposed to separating ourselves, separating ourselves from it. Thank you. I'm Jim Monning. Somebody mentioned the enemy in the room. I actually uh, work for a group of Labour Party councillors. I'm a member of the Labour Party, so I'm probably the enemy in this room. <laughs> and, uh, uh, like talk, in Scotland, I work, work at, uh, as one of my jobs is put in East Ayrshire for a, a, a small group of Labour councillors. But uh, in Scotland, there's even sort of further erosion of powers because we have what they call a national council tax freeze, which we used to call rate capping, which is, it was the same thing. We used to all be up in arms against it. It seems to be quite acceptable now. It was under a concordat by the SNP government, which was basically a kind of veto Corleone type of concordat. <laughs> If you don't agree, it's you cut six percent. If you do agree, it's two point six percent. That sort of thing. But it's uh, what Michael was saying about the no accountability uh, is, is happening in Glasgow. We have arms length companies now running housing, now running sport and leisure. So the, the, la the local Labour and Tory councillors can take up that shop steward role. They can say, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'm with you. I'll write a letter to the Housing Association, the Housing Corporation. They're no longer the people who are responsible for all these things." And in fact, in Glasgow, I think it's a councillor David Meekle, I think is the most yeah. popular councillor. Highest yeah. votes are Tory. Because he does exactly that kind of thing, you know, a tree fell down, there's dog shit, and he, he, he takes up that kind of shop steward role. And, and I think what Graham Campbell says is important, we have to realise that we're probably back to the stage of that pre 1980s thing, where sort of people power and acting on individual sort of cases is probably where we are right now. I also, my, my, my better job, my more acceptable job, is I'm an administrator of Govan Hill Baths Community Trust, where we occupied a council closed building 11 years ago and fought for 11 years to take back in and take community ownership. And one of the poorest areas of Glasgow are rebuilding. Uh, uh, the swimming pool there. So it's maybe the situation is that maybe things that we recognise as, as uh, 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 sort of tools against the working class, against council services like social enterprises and the big society, might actually just be the opportunities that we need to sort of get the back into sort of, sort of community roles and fight back. Okay, uh, first of all, I, I want to um, apologise. I said that wasn't. <laughs> um, I clearly tried to put too much into the meeting and then you don't punch things out. So the reason I didn't talk about the councillors in the 80s was it was here is because I run out of time, not because they weren't led by the SWP. That wasn't the reason for it. Um, so uh, the specific questions, first of all, in terms of the enabling council, um, I mean, there are, there are now a number of local authorities who are, you know, this is a, are, are further down the, the, the slippery slope here. I think Brent is, uh, is the one who's charging ahead and they, they want to have... Um, I think the uh, easy council is the phrase that they've used, you know, like, a, like easy jet, you know, that they will just be a, you will pass through and you will pick stuff up. But the enabling council is, is clearly here. This is what some of them want to get on. And what it means is that, that, that for whatever services, everything will be put out of tender. Not just, you know, uh, not just school meals and school cleaning, but the schools themselves. Well, we see that through the, through, uh, the academies and the, the free schools, you see that happening. Not just uh, in terms of bins, uh, bins and refuse collection, it will mean not just uh, local authority, uh, old people's homes or children's homes, those things are starting. There's a number of projects, uh, pilot projects already happening with looked after children um, in Liverpool and various different places where those things have been put out to, uh, to, to tender. And um, of course, the government and local government say that uh, when this happens, it will always be based on quality, but from experience, we always know that it will be based on price. And this is about opening up to the market and, and moving down that way. The comment who spoke is absolutely right. In many of these circumstances, in many of these cases, the companies that buy in claim to be nice. Um, they claim to be social housing uh, landlords rather than council housing. And actually, they are increasingly are very, very large housing providers with huge turnovers, with people at the top who are on huge salaries and who don't invest in housing. So just because they're a social housing landlord does not mean that they are, you know, all cuddly and nice and warm. They're, you know, they, they don't invest in people's housing. Uh, it's absolutely right with the um, when looked after children facilities have been put out to tender. Those that have stepped in to, to run the tender have been local charitable organisations and voluntary sector organisations and again people sometimes think oh well that's not quite so bad but the pressure on these organisations is that they now run in exactly the same way as big businesses 
You know, and this has been going on since the 1980s, and just because it is the Royal Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Children, or just because it's personal social services with a long history of uh, voluntary sector organisation, when the very process of bidding for the contracts means that they have to shape up and be businesses. And that's exactly what they are. And that's how they operate and that's how they, how they act. They're in no way nice. And if you want a, a story about where that takes you, there is a company that I'm sure you'll have come across which is called Capita, which is one of the oh, biggest yeah. providers of local government services. And it's an interesting story really because Capita has come from nowhere. The roots are in a town called Blackburn. Blackburn, Lancashire, 1,000 holes or whatever it is but just up the road from Preston. But the interesting thing is that the MP for Blackburn is Jack Straw, and they were connected with Jack Straw, they used Jack Straw's position under the Labour government, they have moved themselves in, and now Blackburn, uh, Blackburn Council is a unitary authority, and it's an amazing picture. Have you ever drive into Blackburn? Most of you will never ever want to go to the place, but if you do want to go to Blackburn, as you drive down the hill into Blackburn, you hit a, a road called Barbara, Ca uh, Barbara Castle Way, Right, it's named after Barbara Castle, the left Labour MP, and confronting you is the first building of Blackburn City Council, and in huge letters, it's a nine-storey building, huge letters, one pair, it says Capita, and at the bottom it says Blackburn City Council. <laughs> and it feels like you are entering a company town. Yeah. They run the schools, they run the council, they run everything, and that is where we're going, that's what enabling councils are about, and those who have then bought in for those schools, those dustbin centers, whatever, you are not accountable to them. You're absolutely right, we can be the shop steward, we can complain, but they don't have to take any cognizance of you, you can tell you to piss off. You know, the social landlords, I'm having terrible problems in Preston, we've got damp housing in the social landlords. In the olden days, when it was council, you, at least as a councillor, you could take it on and you could force the debate and you could push it on and hopefully get something done. But quite frankly, Contour, who are the housing providers, the third biggest housing provider of social housing in Britain, just don't even meet me. They refuse to acknowledge my existence because there's nothing putting them on. So that's exactly what it means in terms of democratic accountability. Um, the irony of all this, the irony of all this is that the traditional Labour Party model, and I'm glad you're people from the Labour Party here, but it does seem to me that that traditional, that we are councillors, that we are elected to represent people and we will administer the local state, the enabling council actually undermines all that. They don't have a position in, in, in that thing. It's marginalising so, so what's the you know what, what's the point of being a Labour councillor if you can't even in their terms if you can't even administer the local state because it's now not there to administer it's now put up to privatisation. So in a strange way that opens up a space for those of us who are in the radical left as councillors and those of us who are Labour councillors and those of us who are SNP councillors of their objective whatever the plan that we could that there might be a gap for actually saying that those councillors who think that we should have proper accountability, proper democratic control over these organisations, that we should start to work together because if we shut up and go, then this is going to be dominated by big businesses in that way. And the final thing I just want to say is that there is a crisis coming for those of us that are involved at these levels, and it's called the localism bill. And it means that I tried to put too much in, but with it, and, and so I mentioned Phil Pratt, and I didn't talk about, and I didn't talk about Phil Pratt not because he was a Communist Party member, and not an SWP. So that just, just to be emphasise, that's not what that was about. But you know, Phil Pratt, if you read his book, Our Flag Stays Red, he talks about how he fought against the evictions, and he fought against the evictions of people who were in the BNP, and by doing so, he won them from the BNP. You should read that chapter in that book. It's a wonderful book. It's very easy. It's very accessible. But I'll tell you, there are now going to be evictions up and down this country. I got a phone call two weeks ago from a woman who had lived in a council house for 40 years. It's now no longer a council house, it's now a social landlord that runs it. And as her children have left, her husband has died, she's on her own in a three bedroom house. And she's been told she's got to move. She's got to move to a one bedroom house because she is now under occupying that house and there are families in need who require it. If she doesn't want to do that, they have told her she will be charged £60 in addition to what she pays. Uh, from she, she will have to find an extra £60. There are evictions coming up and down this country because of the bills that they're bringing in, because of the housing benefit payments, and we are going to have to organise. And for those who say we organise in the community, of course we do, but we don't forget that those people who live in those communities are also workers and trade unionists. And therefore we don't draw a distinction between I'm a community activist and I'm a trade unionist because I'm a trade unionist who lives in a community and in my community work I'm a trade unionist and we will be stronger if we bring those things together. And if we want to start to have an impact in the council, as councillors, 
whether we are in the radical left or whether we're in Labour, we have to be throwing ourselves into the defence of those people who are evicted, the defence of those, those schools that have been privatised, the defence of those local authority old people's homes which are going to be sold off. We have to be at the forefront of those struggles because the world is becoming more vicious and we have to be there in the struggle with the people and positing an alternative. The alternative is the alternative to capitalism, the alternative to our world of meeting people's needs is absolutely fundamental and where we need to go forward. And we will get that gap. That's the point I was saying about being the shop steward. The shop steward notion is not just to be the best person for, for cleaning the trees and picking up the dog shit. That really isn't anything that I really want to do for the rest of my life. It's not real. But by doing those things, it allows us to talk and gain the confidence of those people who for so long, for so long, they have been shat on by politicians. We don't listen to them. We don't represent them. And we have to build that confidence. They treat all politicians with suspicion. We must be part of rebuilding that, that sort of uh, community orientation, building up that confidence, gaining the confidence of those, uh, of those people in those communities. And from that, start to talk to them about the different vision and the different vision of a different world. And if we start to do that, I think we can start to rebuild the radical electoral left in the councils so that hopefully one day we have lots of SWP councillors and not just one, and we have lots of people that we are working with from other political organisations who want to stand and fight and defend local services.